it going, Nick? Doing fantastic. How are you doing? Good, man. Thank you for being open to do this. You and I have known each other for, what, 10, 15 years. It's kind of wild, right? <laughs> it, it's crazy now that we're starting to put numbers on things because, um, yeah, the numbers start getting big and it doesn't feel like they should be that big in terms mm -hmm. of timelines. You're exactly right. Yeah, man. Um, you know, I was talking to someone last week and it's like, we're like friends of friends of someone else. And he's like, I've known you for like 10 years. And it's the kind of thing where like, maybe, you know, right after college, it's like, yeah, I've known you for this many years and we're kind of close. But even just the fact that if you, I guess, kind of like compounding interest, right? Like you, you add just once a month or once every two months over 10 years, you do kind of get to understand who someone is. And it's kind of cool growing up with con close connections and loose connections and uh, just wanted to state that. So, yeah, no. And to your point, I think the loose connections are even more interesting when you see each other, you know, three times a year, two times a year, you really see a progression. Um, because especially with friends that you, you know, genuinely like a lot, it's not like a big thing when you see each other again, it's just, you know, you go kind of right back into the friendship, but within that conversation, oh my gosh, you're, you know, now mar you know, married, have a kid on the way. I mean, big changes that it, it just feels like a lightning bolt because you're not talking to them on like a weekly basis. You know what I mean? Yeah, man. I understand what you're saying. It's um, certain things like can align you to someone really quickly. You'll say, oh, remember that one memory or that one inside joke. Uh, but I have certain, I mean, what comes to mind is Pat O'Connor, right? Um, him and I were partying at your house there in Broader Bowl, <laughs> like right out of school. But he's one of those amazing kids where like, you know, months can go by, years can go by. And it's the same guy <laughs> that, that I remember, you know, and I'm sure you have friends like that too. Exactly. And, you know, I think the older we get, I just gravitate towards just good people. And good people don't deviate from their equilibrium too much, generally speaking. And, yep. you know, life experiences happen, you know, you, you kind of catch up on stuff like that, but you fall, like you quickly within like 30, 45 seconds, I'm like, okay, this is why I like this guy or this gal, you know what I mean? And it's, I don't know, it's cool. Um, it's cool how that happens. Yeah, man. Um, so again, thank you for being one of those people for me. Um, we've known each other for that long, but we've been working professionally together for the last hell. I mean, I was working with a Northwestern advisor right out of school, and then he moved on to a different company and he recommended I, you know, stay with the company. I knew you were doing work with them and I think you had a somewhat smaller portfolio then, but I've appreciated working with you and uh, honestly, just perspective sharing with you and your ability to take my perspective and, and validate it, but also instead of maybe disvalidating things that you might have a different perspective on, you know, saying maybe look at it like this. I think that's a really important skill and anyone that's in sales or account management or even owners of their own company. And I commend you for that. Thank you. And, and honestly, you know, as we were kind of preparing for this, I'm thinking about like what I like most about what I do. And I think the, you know, saying the same thing 10 different ways to resonate with the person that I'm talking to. And to your point, not just, you know, it's so easy in any conversation to just want to share your opinion, your view, you know, an example of why this, ha you know, this happened to me and I'm really just waiting for you to stop talking so I can start sharing, but really, you know, listening and then, you know, trying to curate the message based on the recipient and framing it in a way that will make the biggest impact to mm -hmm. actual action. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think semantics, how you word things are really important. Anyone that's in, honestly, any relationship, but specifically in sales or where you're basically asking someone for something in, in exchange for something else. Um, you know, this is a podcast about personal development, motivation, um, time management, you know, goal setting and those kinds of things. Um, just to tell you a story before we hop into maybe your background and getting into the reason I brought you on is I had a a call last week with a, an account where they were paying a very small amount per month. And I work in SaaS <laughs> technology sales. 
And my, my job was to get them to understand that we had shifted our go-to-market strategy and that we couldn't at, we couldn't have them pay that little for the service anymore. <laughs> I came to the call with a specific um, idea of how it was going to go, which is that there's no way they're going to understand this. They're not going to be able to afford it. And I came to the call with just almost like, I'm so sorry I have to do this, um, but it wasn't the best way to do it. And toward the end of the call, I understood maybe a better way to approach it would have been to use different words like, this is a great new package. This is how we're going to market. This is how enterprise companies are using it. Instead of you're a company that's paying this much, I'm sorry, you can't pay this much anymore. I have to be the one to, to kick you off of the platform. That's all really negative language, right? As opposed to maybe more positive language. And in that moment, I, I realized I, I judged that person as incorrect or I judged them as, as too, maybe too frugal to, to afford the new $50,000 solution. Um, so that's an example of where maybe I could have done better and um, just wanted to share that with you. Maybe, maybe there's ways that you've done that in, in, in the past uh, to be able to, you know, like achieve what you want while also helping the person get what they want out of, out of the conversation. No, I think, you know, two really good things I hear in there is, you know, preparation is just so key and not only, you know, the material and how you want to, you know, frame the conversation, but also you know, who are you talking to and what type of situations have they probably experienced as a company where they're giving it, delivering this message to a client and trying to frame it or help them understand, you know, in whatever world I'm speaking to, hey, this is similar to, you know, how you do X in your business. Um, I think it's just so important. And, you know, when I'm talking to people, I find, you know, I, I, I use not only different verbiage because in the finance world, people call things uh, by the wrong name often. And I know what they're talking about. And, you know, I can try to correct them or I can just speak their language and actually get the message across. Yeah. And I think it's, um, you know, just so important to know who you're talking to. And to your point, the second point of, you know, and, and I try not to do this and, I continually have to work on this, but not prejudging somebody, especially in terms of how big I think they can think. Because mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, it's easy to look at somebody on paper and say, okay, this person works at X. I work with a lot of people at work there. I have a good idea of what their salary range is. Mm -hmm. And in the past, I might have kind of captive, you know, put them in a bubble that says, okay, this person is only going to think about these things where, you know, I'll get surprised and somebody is really thinking big or vice versa. You know, somebody makes a lot of money and, you know, I can't get them to dream bigger or to think bigger than their current reality. Um, and so I'm constantly reminded that you just can't prejudge and, you know, put somebody into a box before you really get into a conversation. Yeah. And that's exactly an example of what I mean about perspective shifting you know, in that moment, you change your perspective because you understood that maybe you're prejudging or assigning them uh, a limit to what, <laughs> how high they might think, or on the other exactly. end, someone that might, you know, so you obviously ask people to, to do certain things with their money throughout the day, right? Um, which is, which is a tough thing to do. But, you know, some people might be more willing to try new ideas. And that, that person that might make a lot of money that doesn't want to try new ideas that is just as difficult probably to not come to that conversation saying, uh, you know, no way will they try this. No, you know, um, there, it's going to be a tough one to, to get them to say yes to. But even, <laughs> even as I'm talking about this now, like I'm guessing what you might be motivated by. Right. So there's so much about conversations that um, there are some truths to, to human connection, I think, but um, it's kind of this constantly evolving thing. And, in a way, the art of conversation is a big reason I'm doing this podcast. So it's it's been a fun experiment for me. Yeah. And, you know, it, especially post-COVID, you know, communication is just so key. And not how well you can write or how well you can deliver a message, but really how well you can listen. Yeah. And not only listen, but, you know, care. Care is such a um, you know, there's cer certain levels of care, but 
really, you know, you, you tell me something and I say, okay, well, why is that important? And even though, you know, I want to get out of, you know, somebody tells me um, I want to pay off my house and, you know, naturally you just say, okay, one less bill to pay, but getting behind, okay, why is that important? Well, you know, my grandfather paid off his house early and he was able to do X, Y, and Z, or, you know, uh, my parents still have a mortgage that they really can't afford. And, you know, they're 85. So yeah. not just taking what they say on surface and saying, okay, I think I know what you mean by that, but mm-hmm. really just diving deeper when it's appropriate and um, getting behind the true objective or the true reason why somebody thinks a certain way or does something a certain way. Yeah. And I mean, get to the why is something that's pretty common in, in the kind of business communication courses now, but I think it's, it's all this, it's a really important lesson because I mean, in what I do, I can kind of say, this isn't going to work, or this person is maybe motivated by the short-term solution. But if I can attach the why it sticks it, it, in tech terms, it comes becomes more sticky, right? Like yeah. I can get them to understand this isn't just about this project. This could lead to your promotion. This could lead to the companies making their quotas this year, right? Um, so that why always thinking bigger is, is really, really important. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not a, I, I try to be a better reader. I listen to a lot of books on tape, but my Same. absolute favorite book, and I, I wish it had a different title because uh, I just feel like it's kind of misleading, but uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Have you ever yeah. read that book, Dale Carnegie? That's what I'm saying. There's like truths to human communication. That is like the Bible of, of anyone that, <laughs> that talks to people it, on a daily basis. You know? it was, yeah, it was written in the 1920s. And it's just, it, it just how to be a good person. And that just doesn't change. You know, like the avenues of how we communicate or what kind of expectations are in terms of turnaround time. But at the end of the day, it's, you know, being a good person, caring, doing what you say you're going to do and just, you know, um, not taking yourself too seriously and just trying to help people. Yeah, totally. And there's a point where when I was earlier in my career, I would get really robotic when I was giving demos or saying certain things. And I realized just catching on to the last thing you said, you know, really be human, be, be open to make mistakes, be open to be vulnerable. Don't try to have everything perfectly scripted because it's, it's, you know, people can see right through that. And uh, when I think of that book, there's a couple of, of the tenets that I think of. One is use people's first name a lot. The other one is to show sincere appreciation. And I'm someone that maybe I tend to be more on the people pleasing side. I tend to be more on the, um, you know, not, I wouldn't say ass kisser, but like, yeah, like I like to make people feel good about themselves. I just inherently do, but you can really, I, I know I've noticed that I can really overdo it for some people. So the, the trick is only only say that I'm appreciating something when I really appreciate it and say why, like, okay, you know, this is why I really appreciate it. Um, and the second one, uh, using people's names. I do think that on that one, I would give maybe Dale some feedback and that you can really overdo that one too. Um, For sure. Cause as a sales guy, I know when I'm being sold to. And when some people, when some, someone uses the word Nick or, you know, so much Nick, well, you know what, Nick, let me tell you what, Nick, it's like, it kind of is like, I feel kind of dirty and slimy. So For <laughs> that's sure. one that I would not recommend. <laughs> that That is a very delicate precipice of this guy's a good communicator. And, or it's like, okay, I, I get it. You know, my name, yeah. let's move past that. Like, <laughs> yeah, keep it going. Um, but it, it's funny in this, you know, um, what I'm finding is post COVID, you know, whatever that, if we're post COVID, you know, whatever the case is, but, you know, getting back to just like basic of, you know, doing what you say you're going to do, follow through, um, just being a good person. And like those, what I consider just basic, I mean, what you have to do to be successful in life are almost a differentiator now. Like when somebody emails me something that, you know, I could send an email back, but I just pick up the phone and call them and we talk on the phone and, you know, we just get it handled. Like those little things make such a difference. And because people aren't expecting, you know, uh, not only a quick response, but also 
actual genuine communication and not just, hey, here's a link. Here's how to fill out this form online. Yeah. But yeah, you know what I mean? And it's, I don't know, I, I'm just constantly amazed. Even, you know, I, I know you know this, but I wear a suit every day and I can't tell you how many times I'm on a Zoom call Mm-hmm. And people are like, wow, you're dressed up. And, you know, in my head, I'm like, this is what I've done for 10 years. And I I don't know. I, I think how you feel about yourself, how you present yourself just makes such a difference. And um, I don't know. Like like I said, I, I wouldn't have thought twice wearing a suit. I, I feel weird if I come in on the weekends or after hours and I'm in a polo or something. Like I, I feel like I'm kind of sneaking into the office. Mm-hmm. But, you know, some of the guys wear that on a regular basis and I'm all good with that. But, you know, it's I don't know, just doing those little things just makes such a big difference in the, you know, overall. Um, the way somebody perceives me, I guess, is the best way to put it. Yeah, I think it's that kind of long term perspective that that you have that even people like Warren Buffett have you know, do, do the small things right. And the big things will happen for you. But you've said a couple of things in the last 20 minutes, I think. And I, I keep almost delaying the, the meat of the podcast because this stuff is just so good. Um, in, in the post COVID world, there are ways to differentiate yourself. And what's funny is those things maybe would have been naturally uh, remedied, to, you know, three years ago, you have a boss, you go into a, a, an office, so you have to wear a shirt with a collar. Now that we're all a lot of us are from home, I wear this stuff every day, right? But there are some days where it's like, oh, because I'm in my athleisure, it is much easier to go and chill on the couch for maybe 20, 30 minutes in the middle of the day where I wouldn't be able to do that in the past. And it's like, if I'm wearing a suit, <laughs> uh, maybe I don't do that, you know? And um, another thing you said toward the beginning of the podcast was just about being a good person, communication, listening. So many people listen with the intent to respond. And I get caught up in that. Like, oh, I can't wait to say this nugget that's mm-hmm. gonna get me closer to the to the close of my deal. Um, and I, you know, when I when I hear my call recordings back, I can hear myself almost cut people off from the final word of their sentence. And I'm like, oh, come on, Nick, like just work on that a little bit more. Um, and, you know, I think listening is is going to continue to be more and more important because, you know, that's one thing that we all continue to we're up against kind of some stuff that we can't control, you know, on, on our phones, uh, our attention spans are getting shorter and shorter. And I think in the next 20 or 30 years, if everyone you and I can listen in our career, we're just going to be more and more successful. That's how I see it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're spot on. And I and it's, it, it's so I. I don't know. There's so many things that I do on a daily or try to, you know, perfect on a daily basis. And then when we're, you know, out at a social event or at a party, you know, you're around a circle of people, somebody's telling about their story to Europe. And then you see this one person out of the corner of your eye that's just like chomping at the bit. And in my head, I'm like, okay, I know that person, you know, just went to Greece or wherever. And they're just so excited to yeah. come in and tell their experience. Yeah. And yeah, you know, it's, it's a constant, at least for me too, because as you know, I love talking. I, I just, I love it. Um, I love communicating with people. I love just meeting new people, but you know, it's so the, the saying so old, but you know, to be interesting, you have to be interested mm-hmm. and most people just love to talk about themselves and that's not negative, mm-hmm. but you know, I, I'm, naturally just a very curious person and so i think this this job just is so perfect because there's really nothing that's off limits at least in my head um somebody could say hey i prefer not to talk about that and i say sounds good and then move on but you know just to continually to ask questions and you know the point where they think okay this guy is going to start talking about his thing oh so you know you just shared about the first half of your trip what do you guys do for the second half and then they get to keep going. And I mean, I mean, it's amazing, you know, people come back and say, Oh my gosh, you know, this person is so interesting. Like I really enjoyed talking to him. Like, what does he do? Well, I don't exactly know. And the reason is, you know, that person that they really like said 10% of the words and the overall, you know, 20 minute interaction. And they're just attentive and asking good follow-up questions, clearly listening, you know, it's just, um, 
it's amazing when you just be quiet and my business coach mm -hmm. would tell me right now, just stop talking. Mm -hmm. I, I have to continue to work on saying less just in general. Mm -hmm. So at that, I'm going to pause because I will keep talking if I don't. <laughs> no, I'm the one asking you this stuff. Um, we can definitely shorten the part about your history and get to that. No, I, the, 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 I yeah. have no, I mean, I, like I said, people like talking about themselves and I'm one of those people. So, um, yeah. and I'm in no rush. Yeah. I, I've gone to a lot of networking events and more recently, I'm kind of just like, uh, turned off by them because so many people do tend to talk and talk and talk. And, um, maybe at my patience for people have, has gotten less, but I'm trying to sit there and listen. And then you know, I get the chance to say one thing and then they, they cut me off and then they, they say the next thing. And I'm just like, ah, oh, like, why am I dealing with this subpar, <laughs> this really not even subpar, but just poor communicator. It's, it can be tough to have patience. And it sounds like you're someone that has patience <laughs> for even that person to say, you know, how was the second part of your vacation? Uh, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. <laughs> well, I can, I can definitely be too patient. And one of my partners is really good at, um, in a positive way, ending a conversation when he wants to end it. Where in my head, I'm like, there's no way I would have ended it there just because I, I do let people go and yeah, I'm cool with it. But to your point, the, the tricky part of being a good listener is that most people are not good listeners. And most people fall into that category of, oh, but five years ago, we went to Ibiza and did this. And it's like, mm -hmm. okay, man, like, that's not the point of what we were talking about. So mm -hmm. to your point though, it, it is tough to manage that of like, I wish this person was better. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, sometimes it's not the case. Yeah. So the only reason I would, wanted to get into history is because I'm trying to suss out kind of why you do what you do. And, you know, a lot of people start with, well, I, in college, I studied this, then I, I, I went on to this and I switched jobs and got into something I really like. You know, I think that if we can skip all that and you're someone that I can see enjoys what you do every day. You you've been at the same company now for over 10 years. I'd love to hear just basically like, what can you give me like what you do and why you do it? If you have, if you've thought about that at all. Yeah. So I really, when I boil my job down to like one sentence, it's help people identify their goals and become and create intentionality to make those a reality. So, like I said earlier, you know, I'm just naturally curious and I've always not to like, you know, I, I need to know how this works, but, you know, somebody, you know, is doing X and I, my instant thought is, oh, how does that comp structure work? Like, okay, so what are your bonus targets? Like, mm -hmm. how does that work? And in my, in my role, I can ask those questions and I've gotten maybe too comfortable asking because sometimes you know, on the weekends, we'll be at a party and Gwen will nudge me like, hey, just this is not the time. And I, I'm just so comfortable like, oh, so like, how does that, comp you know, how are you compensated? Like, what's the spread on this? <laughs> I um, know what you mean. I mean, I, I just, I love it. And I just <laughs> love knowing how stuff works. But um, I think the other thing is, I just like being helpful. Uh -huh. And, you know, it, when I was thinking about this, I mean, finances are so important and there's just no education in our K through 12 or even college for that matter. I mean, unless you're an econ major, you're really not taking a budgeting class or, yeah. you know, how does debt work? I mean, yeah. how much should you be saving? Like, so fortunately for me, th there's a huge need out there. And I think too, you know, it can be so daunting like, you know, you start asking yourself question, okay, should I be doing this? Should I be doing that? You kind of go down a rabbit hole. And what I found is people just, you know, the, in, the um, I don't know, regular state for humans is status quo. And so you kind of go down this rabbit hole. Of, this seems like a lot. So I'm just going to do nothing. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, you know, and I share this with people all the time. Like if it's important, then you got to make it important on a daily basis. Yeah. Like somebody told me recently, you know, um, it was kind of a complicated business case would say, Hey, this is important for us to do. And we've been talking about it for a long enough time that I could be direct with them. And I said, you know, if it is really important, 
you got to make it important on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Here's how we get to the solution. Mm -hmm. Here's what the next step is. But mm -hmm. you guys have to discuss amongst yourselves, which of these three options do you want to do? Mm -hmm. And just because you say it's important doesn't mean any action is going to get done. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, I, I don't know. I, I've just seen firsthand how much of a difference putting even just a basic plan together mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of how I got interested in this when I was thinking about it. So in senior year of high school, I went to North Central we, econ class. We learned about compounding interest. And I was like, I like that. And so I went to my mom's financial advisor at the time. And I said, I want to open a, up an account. And she pulled out her financial calculator and said, if you invest this much, this is what it's going to turn into. And I said, sounds good. And so in general, and I'll try not, well, I guess this is a, I, I'm so used to saying, I'll try not to share my philosophical beliefs with clients because I can share that often. But, you know, one of my biggest life philosophies is if there's a definitive, hey, I wish, you know, hey, I wish I could have done this in the past or, you know, where you look back and you really, um, you know, say, man, I really missed that opportunity. If that's really high and the entry level is very low, like just do it. You know what I mean? Like if, if there's anything where I can look back and say, man, this could be a really big regret. Mm -hmm. I got to spend 20 minutes to do this. Mm -hmm. Just do it. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't know. It's yeah. Well, two <sighs> things I picked up there, you know, you talked about do it on a daily basis. I think it was there was some quote about an act and a habit and excellence. And it basically boils down to, if you want to be excellent, you got to do it on a daily basis and you can't just become excellent. It, the excellence is, is just a habitual thing. So if you want someone to, you know, understand their goals and meet their goals, I think that word daily, you know, on a daily basis is, is really pivotal there. And what you just said about, um, um, just the the notion of not having maybe regret later in your life. That's how Bezos started Amazon. He said, I'm trying to maximize the or the likelihood that I will not be on, on my deathbed and say, I could have done this, but I didn't, right? So he wants to minimize regret. And I, I don't think he even used the word regret, but um, you know, if I laid my head on the pillow today and I said, it would have taken me 20 minutes to do that one thing, and that would have been the most important thing I would have done all day a year from now, you know, and I didn't do that thing. I would feel a sense of regret. And maybe that's fear. Maybe the, the primal motivator there is, is fear or um, I don't know, maybe even just sadness. Right. Um, but I just wanted to state that, that, you know, that 20 minute thing, if people could shift their mindset around how to get that thing done, um, they might be more inclined to want to do it. Yeah. And I think another like mindset, mindset shift that I'm constantly focused on is opportunity versus a task. So, I mean, countless times throughout the day, something comes up that you were unexpected and it, it really is a task. You know, you got to respond to this client or, um, you know, something happened. I just got to take care of it. And in your head, you could say, man, I really don't have time for this you know, just kind of poo poo your way through it mm -hmm. or, you know, viewing it really as an opportunity that, Hey, I work with this person. They trust me enough that they sent me their benefits info. Of course they need an answer by the end of the day. I have an opportunity to, to really help them versus just saying, Oh, this is a task. And I just shoot off yeah. a kind of random email. And so often throughout the day, throughout life, those opportunities versus tasks come up. It's really a mindset shift, you know? It's like, um, this is so silly, but there are times where I'm like, I don't want to do yard work today. And I, I remind myself like, no, you have an opportunity to do yard work because you own yep. this house with yep. your wife. Like, yep. it's yours. And I mean, really anything that you do, it's that mindset. And I'm just so focused on a daily. And I, I really try to use the word driven because 
you know, driven and motivated. There's a great uh, David Goggins quote, who I just absolutely love, you know, motivation comes and goes, but if you're driven to do something, Mm -hmm. nothing's going to stop you until you get there. I mean, it's, um, and I'm just driven to be positive and just to live a life of positivity and what you put out tends to come back to you at least one fold, if not tenfold. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're definitely someone that's, that's positive. And even just that mind shift of, I, I, I have to do yard work to, I get, I get to do yard work. It kind of even sounds cheesy rolling off my tongue, but if you really like own that and say, I get to like, well, I don't have to, but I get to make my house that I bought that I'm proud of look beautiful. Right. Um, exactly. It's a really interesting thing. What happens when you just take that one or two steps further than the word I get to, you know? Um, and I think that positivity can drive you to maybe pick up the rake and actually, you know, break, break the leaves. But I'm someone that once I get going, all of a sudden I get my, my, my podcast on or, you know, some sort of music. Okay. Now I break the leaves. Now I can maybe trim the hedges or, you know, it's like you get going, you get in a momentum. And I, sometimes just picking up that, that rake, that first thing uh, after you say I get to is the hardest thing of, of the whole day. It, you're exactly right. And, you know, it's like the, you know, getting on the treadmill, the hardest part is getting on like the difference between mile and I'm not a runner, but mile one and mile three isn't that big of a Delta, but between mile zero and, you know, one lap around a track, Mm -hmm. like that's really where the decision gets made. And, you know, I, I think, you know, the, it, just the daily mantra. And I, I try not to like share this too much because, you know, some people take it as like woo woo. And uh, I don't know, I don't know what people think. And I don't really particularly care, but you know, on a daily basis. So I have a, a notebook here. I'll, mm-hmm. I'm a big fan of daily commitments, but I have this little notebook that I just carry around with me. And mm-hmm. if I open it up, I mean, it's just padded up every day. And I write down my to-do list on it. But the first thing I do in the lower left-hand corner is I write my daily mantra. Mm-hmm. And that, I don't know, I don't know how it all works. But I just write, and it's always something along the lines of, you know, uh, I'm so grateful that money and successful people flow easily and unsolicited to me. Mm. And it's, it, it's just amazing, you know, how that has manifested into my life. But it's a, a statement of just gratitude and appreciation that mm. I'm able to do what I do. And you know, it all kind of filters into that get to want to positive mentality. Um, But I think it's important to note that you can't be positive at all costs. And I think of, um, it's kind of silly, but a Parks and Rec episode where Chris Traeger, who's just overtly positive and just very happy-go-lucky. Are you a Parks and Rec guy at all? Love it. Yeah. It's an awesome show. Okay. And he's talking to Aziz Ansari. It's when Anne is pregnant and, you know, Chris, you know, Anne says something and Chris you know, tries to fix it. And I can fall into that trap because I just want to be helpful. And I, you know, know. I just want to help people. And sometimes it's like, just shut your mouth. And I remember Aziz Ansari said that the two magic words is that sucks. And yeah. so there's a delicate balance of being positive, but also hearing somebody and knowing, okay, is it, is this the right time for a solution? Or do I just need to empathize with them and, you know, understand their situation? So, you know, positive at all costs is not the right answer. But um, I mean, it, it, it's so simple. Like you, you see, you go to any store, you know, you go to a Lowe's and there's one guy at Lowe's I just love. And he just walks around with a smile on his face. And he looks so um, easy to talk to. He's so helpful. He's happy to be there. Like, that experience difference is, you know, versus the guy that just slumped over and just, you know, makes eye contact and then quickly, quickly looks back down. I don't know. It's, um, it's amazing how people's, 
how people are so quick to mirror what your vibe is. And yep. if you're just positive, people want to be positive with you. They, it's just, it's crazy how all this stuff, it's just intertwined. Yeah. And there's, there's plenty of people at Lowe's and Home Depot that don't have that. So if I met someone that was there helping, that was happy to help, I know I would have a better experience in those places. I think, uh, I think you and I are similar though, in, in that way, because I, I do tend to want to help people so much and just solve the problem where in the past I might have skipped the empathy part. You know, I, I know how it feels when I'm going through something tough and someone says, ah, oh, that sucks. You know, I'm just like, oh, they, they get it. They understand. And they might want to solve the problem, but uh, no one can solve the problem, right? Like that's even that's kind of a anomaly of a statement. You can't solve my problems. I can't even solve my own problems a lot of the time, right? Um, and I, you have a wife. I have a serious girlfriend. <laughs> Pretty easy to get caught up in, a, in an argument if you try to solve too many problems for them <laughs> instead of just listen, you know? <laughs> yeah, or say, well, at least this didn't happen because I'm, I think I'm very good at framing and saying, you know, looking at the positives and that's how I just live my life. Like something shitty happened and I'm in my head, I'm like, well, you know, this could have happened. And then I just move past it. Not everyone is wired that way. Mm -hmm. And I have a, a really close friend. He's, uh, he's in his nineties. We met eight years ago and, um, go to Butler games together and, you know, mm -hmm. get breakfast every now and again. And, Mm -hmm. uh, he was a psychologist and he said, Andy, you know, your positivity is positively unique, but you have to make sure you don't get frustrated when other people don't think like you mm -hmm. or when people can't, you know, um, I, I mean, it, it, it's just crazy how one can think, okay, th this is the way I think. So why, why don't you think that way? And yeah. like somebody's just harping on something. And in my head, I'm like, I would have moved past that five weeks ago. But this person is wired differently. So you can't get frustrated um, by the way that people are. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know if that, if I did a good job of kind of explaining that, but. No, um, I think you did. And previously you mentioned this business advisor. Is that the same person or separate? So I have a business coach and then uh -huh. this is a, uh, kind of a mentor, but just a, a really close friend. And yeah. we met at, um, golly, some organization, it's not Kiwanis, but it's something like that. Um, and he was just a really happy guy. And, you know, we shook hands. He gave me his card. He's like, I'd like to get lunch at some point. I said, sounds good. And yeah, it was like eight and a half years ago. And we get together every couple of months now. And you can see my dog, Benny, in the background sniffing around. But um, I don't know. It's, it's, I'm just, so focused on being around, surrounding myself with good people and positive mm -hmm. people because you can let people drag you down or build you up. And I, I, I don't know, it's just so important, you know, people yeah. that are just positive. Yeah. I have a few mentors in my life too that, you know, they're older men, um, but they're just priceless and and what they've taught me. And a lot of those people are positive you know, um, but even this conversation now, I'm, I'm almost doing an internal audit of people in my own life. Um, you know, I think that the lesson that the person gave you that you guys go to Butler games, it's like, you can't get dragged down by if, if you're on the 99th percentile of looking at things, and I wouldn't say positive, but maybe a, a glass half full type of way, you know, optimistic yeah. type of way. Um, there, that means there's 99 people under you that <laughs> aren't there, you know, and uh, maybe that's the challenge for you is figuring out a way to meet them where they are, not losing your optimism, but um, but connecting with them in 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 a way that they would understand best. You know, um, that's kind of what's coming to mind for me right now. Yeah, and you know, in my world, you know, one of the things I really like is each situation is different. At the end of the day, there's um, only so many ways to skin a cat like a lot of the um, planning concepts or just overall client demographic are the same, but it's how does this person think? What motivates them? Um, a silly way is, you know, do they think in terms of dollars or do they th think in terms of percentage? So when I'm, you know, creating a recommendation, 
I always know exactly what the dollars are per month, per year, per quarter, mm -hmm. and what the percentage of income is. Because there are times where I say something that I think is going to be like, hit really home. Uh -huh. Yeah, hey, you know, based on what you currently have, based on what I'm recommending, <laughs> this happened uh, with a, a larger case that I had, I said, you know, there's $47,000 in fees annually that you're paying that you shouldn't be paying. And if wow. we work together or really, honestly, any other advisor, you wouldn't be paying that. And I, you know, that was a big number to me. She told me she spends $76,000 a year. So you know, it's like half of her annual salary. And she did not bat an eye. And I said, oh my goodness. Um, so in my head, I'm like, okay, that didn't land. And I said, okay, you know, that's 53% of what you spend annually. And she was like, oh my goodness. I mean, then it had the reaction that I was mm -hmm. anticipating. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's kind of a silly example, but mm -hmm. the same message to 10 different people lands 10 different ways. And one person may say, Andy's the greatest financial advisor I ever heard. And, you mm -hmm. know, the 10th person says, this guy didn't say anything that resonated with me at all. And I said the exact same thing. So mm -hmm. I think in that, you know, curiosity discovery phase, mm -hmm. really figuring out what somebody, you know, how somebody ticks is um, then how you come back to really help them because you got to create some action and tie it back to the why. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it goes back to what we were saying too about not semantics, but using different perspective shifts. I mean, to me, that sounds like a lot of money, no matter what, no matter who you are, yeah. but to her, it's like, well, yeah, that, that, that's the, pay to play model in the financial investing. Yeah. She has a lot of uh, call it assets under her name. Maybe that's normal, but when you put it to the, she probably is motivated by saving instead of, you know, if you're spending that certain amount per year, what if I could save that much, you know, then, then those, maybe those, those, that percentage makes a lot more sense in, in her brain. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, go ahead. No, I'm done. Uh, I wanted to ask you one or two questions more than kind of kind of end the podcast. Um, you are someone that is blessed to have opportunities and money come your way nowadays, right? But there probably was a point that you that you didn't when you were probably starting to build your client book there at, at Northwestern. Maybe just give me um, a story of how you set goals in those moments, or um, you know, how did you start in this and and start to st have something from from nothing yeah um it was a grind so at northwestern they don't and it may change i'm not i'm not exactly sure but you know when i started it was call the people that you know and i made it a very quick decision that i didn't want to hound people that i knew so i mm -hmm. had to get referrals but i didn't start with a book of business and mm -hmm. it was just a grind and there were days where we got physical checks back then where i'd open my check or the envelope and there'd be nothing in it. Literally they'd write my name on it and there'd be nothing inside. Oh, and, um, that's almost like, like, that's almost like salt on the wound. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay. okay. <laughs> um, but you know, there were, I was blessed to have a couple of good mentors in the office and seeing the type of work that they were doing, regardless of the income that they were making, but the people that they were meeting with. And, you know, just, made a, I was just so determined that I was going to get there and whether I'm there now or you know in the next couple of years TBD but I, I think going back to those daily focuses because mm -hmm. at least for me annual goals are fun to do in December whenever your fiscal year is but it's so easy to forget about that yep. and if I can you know I have I mean it's it's so silly in my notebook. I write, you know, squares on the top where I say, okay, this is how many meetings I'm going to set today. And I just make an X through them. Or I say, okay, I got to make these five calls. Yeah. Um, and back then it was just like checking off those daily boxes because they said, if you do this, you will be successful. Mm -hmm. And again, going back to that regret, mm -hmm. I didn't want to look back and say, man, I, if I would have done this, you know, I could be successful there, but now I'm doing why, and I really hate it mm -hmm. because I, I really enjoyed 
and I still really enjoy what I do. But if you don't put in that effort, mm -hmm. like we, we train a lot of new reps and our last bullet point is the secret is effort. And it, it it's hard. I mean, it's so easy to see, you know, Jeff Bezos or any of these really successful people and say, man, that life looks easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's easy to forget the 100 hour weeks that they had for 10 years to get to that point. And so I, I, I think just, you know, embracing the grind and just, I don't know, I've, I've always been that way, you know, tell me to do X and okay, maybe I don't know how to do it now, but I'm going to get it done. And if I have to stay in the office till 8 p.m., so be it. But I'm not, I'm not going to look back and say, if I would have done this, man, I really wish I could have done that. Um, mm -hmm. Because living a life of regret is just something I'm not interested in at all. Yeah. And I'm lucky to have always have had a salary. <laughs> my, my, my first job out of school, there was a pretty small one, but you know, now in enterprise tech sales, it's, it's, it's sizable, but having that motivation for me to create the daily habits has been really important. I mean, I'm 10, 12 years into my career now, and I've always told myself, I need to set two meetings a day. And, you know, some people don't show up. Sometimes it's a meeting that is an inbound lead. Sometimes it's an outbound lead. Sometimes it's literally a podcast with you, right? This is all going toward my goals, right? And if, if I can do 10 meetings a week times 52 weeks in a year, like a lot of the meetings I set, when it occurs, nothing comes out of it or you don't, you don't think it does, right? But like it all it all creates momentum. And, um, you know, it's hard. It's hard to set those meetings. This is more just a, a challenge I'm having is I used to be able to send emails to get meetings and some people would bite if I sent enough emails. Um, I'm trying to learn how to use the phone better to do that you know, cold calling. I was never a big fan of, of a straight cold call. I'd almost always have a referral or, you know, send them some note first and see that they opened it or basically find a way to make myself warm instead of cold. But um, that's, that's what I try to do is set two meetings per day, even as an enterprise rep with, you know, 10 accounts, um, set 10 meetings a day that go to my overall goals in my life. Yeah. And those daily Hey, did I have a good day? Cause you know, I can, at least me personally, I can trick myself into saying, um, man, I had a really good day. You know, I closed X, <laughs> I helped this person. Yeah. Um, but if I didn't fill my calendar or my associate didn't set meetings and to be clear, I, you know, those count as meetings in my head. Um, you know, you have a really good week and then nothing the next week. Well, that's not good. And yeah. so like having that daily minimum, I think it's just minimum acceptability is just so important. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, the, oh, what, well, um, you know, that positive momentum is just so key in life because there are times, and I'm sure you feel this, but I'm sure everyone feels this way, where you're just like crushing and you have a call with somebody and you're just exuding confidence, like, yeah. I need to work with this person. Yeah. Generally that meeting goes well. And the trick is when you're not feeling good, how do yeah. you trick yourself into feeling that way? Because it's so, and you know, this. anyone that's on the phone a lot or in meetings, like somebody calls me to try to sell me something. I know pretty quickly, okay, is this person successful? Are they using too many words? Are they rambling? Or is it a clear, confident message? yes or no we're all good if answers no but here's my message take it or leave it mm. and i and to that i'm going to keep keep talking here for a second i've been really focused on curating text messages because text is really the new email exactly i mean yeah. there, there's, in our new, world, there's new things that i'm that i want to learn and that the, the cold call is now probably texting or you know some sort of of new method yeah and so i'm focused on you know, the first, I, I think it's like eight words is what shows up, you know, when somebody opens their text message, at least with iPhone, you know, where you can see, hey, I don't have this number. Hey, Nick, it's Andy with blank, or it's Andy, I know, so and so something that at least gets them to open it. And I'm, I've 
challenge myself to be indifferent of how long it is, but I want the message to be a yes or a no. Mm -hmm. And so I've been sending this message where, you know, I, I send my value proposition, so to speak. And it says, you know, <laughs> I would appreciate it if, or if you're interested, you know, um, like this message or dislike this message. If you like this message, my associate Jamie will reach out to you to schedule a meeting. If not, I'll make a note in my system. I appreciate a response either way, or I, you know, I, I appreciate a response that I think is how I end it. Mm -hmm. And because I'm just so focused on making a decision, yes or no, as easy as possible for the person. Yeah, we, like know, we know the worst thing is like, well, hit me up in six months. Like, oh, yeah. just tell me no, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> so it's, and it's tough because techs were so used to in, informal and does this feel weird that I'm, you know, hi, Nick, comma, you know, enter, enter, and then do another paragraph. Does that feel weird? Maybe. Um, but I want the message to come off good. And I want them to either say thumbs up or thumbs down. I'm indifferent at the end of the day, but I just want a yes or a no. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. I mean, a lot of what I do is I send one or two emails and then I'll send a text or I'll make a call or leave a voicemail. And in, what I'm noticing with that mindset of yes or no, a lot of my asks are really weak. Um, you know, oh, let me know if you want a point of view deck and what account that is. Like if they don't even want to engage with me, no chance I get a response on that. You know, like maybe just the first yes is what I need to go uh, for in the text. No. You're yeah. exactly right. And I think, um, and give me a second here, I'm going to pull this up. It'll be real quick, but uh -huh. you know, I, I, I think it's so easy to take for granted text messages and just like sending something out real quick to get a response versus slowing down, really taking your time with a message. And, um, you know, in this text that I send with, you know, a whole paragraph basically in front of it, I said, you know, Please let me know a few good dates or simply like this message and my associate Jamie will reach out to schedule. If mm -hmm. you don't have interest, just dislike and I'll make a note in my system. I appreciate your response and look forward to connecting when and if it makes sense. And, you know, I, I just try to think if I'm on the other end of this, you want it to be easy because no one's going to open a text and go back to it next week. Like that yeah. just doesn't happen. Um, but any, like that preparation and actually just like, um, care, I, I don't know. It's just so easy to say, I don't know, just fire yeah. off a text, but. Yeah. And it's easy for me to say, these people opened my email. Now I'm going to send eight of the same text out and change the first name. Like people are responding to, to personalization. And what I'm not doing there is saying, if I'm on the other end of this, what really would get me to respond? But my favorite thing of what you just said is like, people don't open it this next week. It's like, okay, so I set a, a podcast call with you, right? And in this one hour of conversation, I've now taken five or six things that can help me tomorrow morning with my full-time gig, right? And I think that's the momentum I'm talking about. It's exactly. really exciting. Yeah, and um, making a decision easy is just so important. And not being scared of a no. Yep. All right, man. I know we're going on um, our time here. So really, really appreciate it. Um, this was a conversation that just rolled. And I, I really liked every minute of it. Um, I try to prep my guests with an agenda. And I could have given you nothing. <laughs> and we could have had this conversation 10 different ways. And um, to, to you, that's, you know, that's a compliment again to, to your ability to create connection and momentum in a conversation. So um, yeah, anything and else that you want to cover? I'm going to end on this. One thing I've been focused on more recently is doing things that are, you know, being comfortable, being uncomfortable. Uh -huh. And, you know, I love talking and you know this, um, but, you know, there's a little bit of nerves of coming on a podcast and re being recorded and, I would lie if I said I wasn't, mm -hmm. it didn't have nerves. And like, whenever that, whenever I get that feeling, I'm like, okay, I need to do that. Yep. Like that's yep. the decision of 
do I want to do this? Uh, kind of. Okay, then the answer is yes, and just do it. Thank you for doing that. Because I, you know, I have some guests that have shared that too, and they at the end of it they say, you know, that was actually pretty easy. Um, but you know, being aware of privacy, being aware of your maybe likelihood that you'd want this to be shared, you know, I'm aware of all that. So thank you for being uncomfortable. And hopefully if you have the chance to do this again, that you, you know, you, you recognize I'd love to. it's a great, not just my podcast, right? Like um, ways that you can get your name out there, your brand out there, you know, it, this, this is a new way to, to show people what you're up to. So I think it comes across really naturally for you and I hope you, you enjoyed it. Yeah, no, this is great. And kudos to you. Cause again, it's, I mean, it's tough on your end to ask people, Hey, can you spend an hour and be on my show? Like, I'm sure there are people that you're like, you start a text and you just don't send it. Mm-hmm. Um, but then when you do hit send, you're like, mm-hmm. regardless of what the answer is. I mean, it's uh, clarity is just a beautiful thing and you don't get it unless you do some action. Yeah. Last thing I'll say, I like to think that I'm, I need to hit my no quota. A lot of people don't respond. And with this, I'm pretty sp- specific on who I co- ask to come on. I'll tell you why I want you to come on. I'll, I'll give you some, maybe some, some uh, sample questions. But with my full-time gig, it's like, if I'm not getting a no response or a no, or, you know, maybe ne- in six months, I'm, as much as you, you think you should, I'm not doing my work because <laughs> yeah, you're not grinding. You're not hustling. A lot of no's before you can get to yeses. You're exactly right. Um, man, I, I've had a great time. Really appreciate you having me on here. It's a, um, I, I take it as a compliment and it's, uh, honestly, it just, it, it feels good to be for anyone to feel wanted in a sense, but I, uh, I'm glad we did this and yeah, appreciate you asking. Sure, man. You got a lot to offer the world, Andy, and I'm, I'm glad to give you a, even if it's just, you know, 20 views. <laughs> we'll get you I up love there. it. <laughs> I love it, man. Thank you. Thanks for having me, brother. <laughs>